You're streaming from your only now. and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the 11th annual Mumbai International Literature Festival and the first one to be completely digital. Co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects, session sponsor, Kotak. The following session is a conversation between Amy Tan and Siddharth Dhanvan Shangi about the pivotal way that editors can influence books. Amy Tan is a prolific author speaker, singer, instrumentalist, philanthropist, artist, and has a leech named after her. Most of you are familiar with her books, which include The Joy Luck Club and her memoir, Where the Past Begins. Siddharth Dhanvan Shangvi is a Goa-based writer whose first novel was the awarded The Last Song of Dusk. He made his nonfiction debut recently with a collection of essays on loss called Loss. We welcome all of you into the session. Thank you. Well, hello, Amy. How are you? 
Good. Wish we were in the same room, but yes, but we are. It's great. So you know, <laughs> among among the six million Americans who have read and loved the Joy Luck Club, is a special fan, Kamala Harris, Vice President Elect of America, who said that Tan's debut novel ranked among her favorites. Should the team of Biden and Harris invite Tan back to the White House, this would be one among the numerous outings. She's been there previously as a guest of the Clintons and then more recently of the Obamas. But to pencil out the famous and powerful as our admirers is to limit the universal reach of a singular and profound work. Dan's books have touched the lives of millions. Their themes of displacement and belonging of error and atonement, the relationships between mothers and daughters, and the relationship of the living world with the world of the formless have made her a unique voice, widely considered legend. She truly is an American master. So deep is her impress on popular culture, she's even essayed a role on The Simpsons, and her band, The Rock Bottom Remainders, has revved up millions of dollars for charity. I've known Tan. I've had the great good fortune and luck of knowing Tan for 17 years and more closely in the last four. I don't know anyone as generous with her presence as Amy Tan. And I know few who are as nourishing of young talent as she is. Her heartfelt avowal for Joey Alexander, a young jazz prodigy resulted in a following for his fine music all throughout America. My own writing in recent years has found refuge in her reading. And this allowed me to begin again and begin anew. And I think if I wrote loss, it was partly, significantly, because of this friendship. Among the qualities that this shy, generous, kind, and brilliant author prizes are loyalty and gratitude. Both find relief in her relationships with Faith Sale, the acquiring editor of the Joy Luck Club, Molly Giles, her writing teacher, and Daniel Halpern, her present editor at Echo Press. A talk will pay homage to the editors and help us understand how they shaped her writing. But before that, Ms. Tan, can I please ask you, what do you think of Kamala Harris? Is she a friend? Oh, She's known Kamala. to you. Yay. You know, a lot of people say she's the first, of course, the first woman vice president elect, but also I think, and they say that she's African American, but I want to say she's Asian American too. She's Indian American. That's and true. that's so exciting for so many of us, for me, especially born in the same city, same hospital, went to public schools and the daughter of immigrant, a little tiny immigrant mother. So we're, we have a lot in common. Um, yeah. I'm so glad. And, and, and do you feel relieved with the change uh, of God in America? I know that you've been really suffering the last four years. Yeah. Where yeah. Sense that you're breathing yeah. again. Breathing, seeing things differently, clearly, blue skies. Um, I think I will be able to write without this cloud over my head. And I think you understand that external circumstances can really mess with your brain, your writing brain, and make it hard to just keep focused on the task at hand. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I feel like I can breathe again. Thank you. So now let's probably go into the more serious aspect of the talk. Um, Faith Sale fell in love with the Joy Luck Club all those years ago in the 80s. She published it, but before that, she loved it and edited it. Do you remember your first meeting with her? And what in that original conversation made you think, yes, my book is in safe hands? I had actually four offers for that book, The Joy Luck Club. And I chose the offer that came with the editor, Faith Sale, because she was a legendary editor. She was the editor of Joseph Heller, for Kurt Vonnegut, for Donald Bartlemey, John Barth. And she also took on new writers and had nourished them and, and grew their books, um, helped them grow their abilities as a writer. And I was a beginning writer. You have to keep in mind, I'd only written three stories and they had bought a book based on that. 
I needed a really good editor who would understand that and where I could say to them, I'm a beginning writer and I need a lot of guidance. And, and she was perfectly happy to do that. I met her about seven months after I turned in the manuscript. Um, and I, it was at a, a classic New York restaurant steak bistro kind of place, very clubby looking. And uh, one of the first things that she said to me was, well, you know, how much she loved the book, et cetera, et cetera. But she said, you know, um, these are all stories that have, you know, a familiar theme to them. There's, there's only one of them that, that doesn't quite go. And I said, really? What's that? She said, it's, you know, this particular story here about a husband. And she said, all the other stories are about mothers and daughters. And I said, really? So that's how blind I was mm. as to what I had written. It seems like such a very obvious thing that an editor would have to tell a writer what this book was about, or at least structurally what it was. And, I, and that's a very big example. But I, I just want to say... Part of the role of the editor is to reflect back what you have written and to see for you the obvious patterns that are there that you may not have even recognized. So she asked, could I, she said, could you write another story um, about a mother and a daughter? And I said, sure. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know where I pulled that one out, but I had to get one to her in the following week. Um, she also uh, said, you know, here's how I see these stories as laying out. I had 16 stories, or I would, once I completed the new one. And she said, I have in mind that we would order them in a certain way, not by mothers and daughters, uh, their particular families, but a, a kind of thematic structure that each of these women are going through something maybe the mothers have lost in the past or the daughters have lost or something about taking control or being, you know. And, and so she had them in piles, four, 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 four. And we talked about that, but then she also said, would you write an interstitial for each of the sections? So that there, she had a great deal of, influence on how that book would be structured and originally a book of short stories this was not a novel these were short stories it was a novel after it was reviewed people called it a novel that's mm -hmm. how it became a novel <laughs> can you give us a few more examples of how faith sale kind of really influenced the book so that we can get a sense of the refinement of a mind um you know, it, it, I would say that that role that she played was much more influential in the newer books, the books that followed that, because what I gave her in the beginning with the Joy Luck Club was something that was fairly polished, and that was because I had Molly Giles as my freelance editor before I ever turned in the manuscript. If I had turned in something as written, it, it would have been a mess. So she, what I gave to her was fairly polished. But in subsequent books, um, she, would, she would call attention to what was not felt. Mm -hmm. That whole word um, encompassing, is this really, are you really in this story? Are you really digging deep enough in this story? Does it matter to you? What's at stake? She understood that there's a quality about yourself as a writer um, that is in the novel. And I'm not saying it's about the character. You are not necessarily that character. But what the story is about and your impulse for writing it uh, is very much based on who you are as a writer. So for me, um, the greatest gift that Faith gave me was to understand me as a writer and as a person, my personal history, or whether I like to eat certain foods, 
it was it was everything. We we were like sisters, and we would go everywhere, and she would know things about me, and I would know things about her, and this all funneled into looking at the book as well. You know, and to be honest, it's it's really strange. I cannot think of too many things specifically that Faith said, except for a lot of encouragement, uh, some subtle things here and there, because her whole um, nature as an editor was, a lot of it was hands off, trust the writer's intuition, and help to guide that intuition um, along the way. And uh, so that was that was Faith. Um, I guess in a sense what she was doing um, was very intimate because she was helping you hear yourself. And that's yeah. a really great service that an editor can pay. You know, yeah. because of the, the nature of intimacy of this relationship uh, between a writer and editor, did you ever have disagreements? And if you did ever, how did you resolve them? You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm a certain kind of writer that I don't think everybody is. And that is that I love feedback. I mm. love criticism when I'm writing a book. Now, if I get criticism in the way bad reviews after I've written the book, that's a completely different thing. It's not useful at that point. But during the writing, if somebody says something and uh, that allows me to ponder what they've said and, and for me to look at it, I love that. I don't always take the advice of people, but I really chose my editors carefully. And these were people who really understood who I was as a writer. Um, they would give me suggestions that I could follow or not follow. Mostly the suggestions, it might be something like, um, I, don't, I don't understand this character or this character, this, this seems a little dark here, but perhaps you need to have it dark. They were reflecting back what they're reading, but with it, and like a reader, but a, a super excellent reader who, mm -hmm. who also understands everything about structure and, and, and language and um, the nature of a narrative. So that, I think, plays a, a huge role. Every single one of my editors, they read this thing as readers. And, and they say what they love about the stories from, from that point of view. But, you know, Molly Giles, for example, she, was, she could be brutal. Um, for some writers, it would be devastating. She would say, she'd mark a passage and say, boring, I'd cut. <laughs> I'd look at it and say, oh, yeah, it, it is boring. But, or I would look at it and say, it's boring. I don't necessarily need to cut it because I actually need a portion of that somewhere else. But what I should do is make it more interesting. So there's a difference there. The difference between it's boring, I cut, and it's boring, I believe you it's boring, you're the reader. Mm. Let's see, I know, you know what I need to do now. Um, and so, yeah. Granton, earlier you said that, um, you know, Faith and you were like sisters. <clears throat> yeah. Right? And so that leads me to a slightly more personal question. Forgive me for asking, and if I'm betraying uh, uh, something that you to might have told me in private. You have a magnificent loft in New York. It's a private hub of cultural nourishment. I know Steve Martin comes there and plays the banjo. Padma Lakshmi trips in, in her Chanel gowns. There are activists, political figures, uh, writers who are refugees have all passed through your sandal. To the world, to the outside world, the, the loft would be a symbol of success of a very famous uh, uh, writer. Um, but yet the acquisition of that loft is directly connected with your relationship with Faith Sale. If that story is not too private, would you consider sharing it? Yeah. Um, first of all, I was the kind of person at the time who never would have imagined I'd live in New York. But New York was dirty, it was dangerous, it was expensive. You know, people were crazy and in your face. Why would I ever live in New York? But one year um, in 1994, 1994, 1995, um, I discovered that Faith had cancer, mesothelioma. And it didn't seem like she had a lot of time. I was coming toward the end of a book and I just thought, 
I need to be with her. And I went to New York. I asked somebody to rent a place, sight and scene. And I got there and what they had rented was a three bedroom, two bath penthouse with unfurnished, you know, and I just cried because my idea was a little basement brownstone apartment. But I lived there for a while and it seemed like Faith was going to live longer. Um, by the end of the year, she was still around. So I thought, well, I need to get something. This is ridiculous to rent this penthouse. So Lou and I went looking and we found this loft, which at the time was very reasonable. <laughs> you cannot imagine how much that would cost now, but back then it was very reasonable and so reasonable that the guy took money. I said, what do you want? You know, I'm the first person to see it. You know, what do you want? And he gave it to us for a lot less money. That was to live there to be with Faith, but for Faith to have a party house. Faith was a party girl. She warned me against party, you know, don't go to parties when I was in the middle of writing the Joy Luck Club or other novels. She was a party girl and she always took me to parties. So he said, you can have your parties here. Here's your royal empress bed that you can sit on, your kitchen, you know, whatever she wanted. So that was for the next four years mm. until she died. That was her party house. Was a party house, but, uh, and I'll just say this very briefly, I also know that you looked after her very deeply at that point in time. I know you're brushing uh, all of that uh, into the sort of joyous encounters, but there was a very profound intervention that you made when she was very sick looking after her as, as a sister would another. So I'm not going to uh, ask you more about that because I know that's private and we should keep it at that. But um, the reason I say it is because it's a testament to how profoundly uh, you valued that relationship. Yes, of course, she was your editor, but then the relationship took on a different connotation, meaning uh, depth and integrity. Um, earlier on, I mispronounced Molly's last name, so I will apologize for that. It's Molly Giles, who led a writing group where you first derived the psychological reserve to write parts of the Joy Luck Club. And one of the first things Giles ever asked you was, where's the voice, where's the story? What were your answers? To her question. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. What a question. I didn't understand what voice was. And and so she she pointed to um, a particular sentence and she said, Well, there's a voice, the voice of a child, um, who's a little bit sassy. Oh, look, here's the voice of a, a older woman. She's rather flippant and, and these are all another when one. Joyla Club was a story, right? That's uh, Joy Luck Club was just, it began with a, a mash, mishmash of stories called Endgame. It was my manuscript that I submitted to get into my first writer's workshop. And it was looked at by two published writers. One was our workshop leaders. One was Elizabeth Hallett, mm -hmm. uh, an incredible writer who writes a lot for The New Yorker. And then Molly. Um, I had chosen Molly because as my private one-to-one -one, because she was a short story writer and won Flannery O'Connor Award just that year. So I was interested in, in a writer's sensibility, not an agent or a publisher. A lot of people would choose these kind of these people hoping to get published. I thought I'm, I'm just a beginner. So Molly said to me, here you have a voice here, a voice here, a voice here. Here you have the beginning of a story here, here, here. And what you should do is pick one voice and one story and start over and write those. Um, that is basically what I did. Um, you know, out of these, this one manuscript that was 13 pages long and a total mess, uh, there were like a dozen stories in there. Um, but the, the question of voice and story remains with me today, and I'm getting a clear understanding of what I'm looking at. I'm not, when I say voice, I think we often get very confused. We confuse the voice with the voice of a narrator of a story, mm. you know, especially if it's first person or third person that people consider to be voice. 
I think of the voice of a writer. When somebody says, oh, I picked this up, I immediately know this is a story by you, Siddhar, you know, that unmistakable. What is it about that, though, that makes it unmistakable, even if you write a different story, you know, ostensibly a different story? There is something about the voice of a writer, I discovered, that has to do about who you are, mm -hmm. your understanding of yourself. And it's really through the writing that you come to understand who you are bit mm -hmm. by bit. I mean, that that's the total um, ecstasy that you have as a writer when you come across things and you can discover who you are. Now, who you are as a writer then determines what your obsessions are. And you have obsessions that may have to do with experiences in your life. They could be about loss or pain, death, uh, renunciation. It could be about, uh, you know, reclamation. It can be about many things, depending on who you are, your purview of the world, um, whether it's morality or um, the deepest emotions that we have for one another. So that, I think, is what I got out of that first uh, session when the writers said to me, what, you know, where is the voice? What is the voice that you have going on? Was the question, what is voice and what is story? Mm -hmm. And then from there, looking at the different voices of the narrators I would have that would tell the story that comes from basically my writer's mind, you know, which is my voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe you have some notes in front of you. Is there something in there um, connected to either Faith or Molly that we can actually speak about um, so that we get a sense of how they worked or how you worked on those initial stories, editing them? Is yeah. it the right time um, to ask you about them? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, I, I should explain to people that, um, you know, what an editor does is not what line editors do. A lot of people think, oh, they're going to correct my punctuation and spelling, and they don't bother with that. That's what a line editor does, and they're very particular. But the editor, um, they're really concerned with the overall story, the characters, the language, and things like that. Um, here's one that from Molly. I was finishing a, The Bone Setter's Daughter. This was after Faith died in 1999. And she read the manuscript for me and gave me a lot of notes. And I, for some reason, I have, I have these things. Bravo, all that's left is, and then she says, I have a lot of stumbly little questions all throughout my stumbly little scrawl. Major addition, I'd like for you to consider a scene where Luling meets Ruth's father and a bit on their life together in California or information on the final fate at Peking Man, blah, 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 blah. So she gave me a list of scenes that she thought would flesh out uh, the story uh, as I had already completed the manuscript, but for me to consider, would this give us more understanding of, the, you know, a lot of backstory kind of things. And I probably took um, most of them because they really were, uh, things that were would look like omissions. Uh, she's not trying to write the story for me, but it was the wondering that led to these questions. Like, I wonder where they met. I wonder why is this person named this? Why doesn't anybody say anything about this name? So she put those things in there, suggesting them. Um, She's, she was in a sense a kind of a doorkeeper, right? Like who was opening up the doors and inviting you to walk into those questions if you desired to. And yeah, in a new way. Um, it's like when you, <laughs> you live in your house and you're, you're blind to what's there. You're just used to it being the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some old piece of furniture you've had for 80 years and it's all, you know, tattered and it doesn't go with anything, but it's comfortable and it's fine. But somebody coming in say, well, why do you have that there? And you can explain it and say, well, it has a lot of sentimental value to me. Or you could say, gee, I, I picked it up off the sidewalk when I was a student and it's just been there. I never thought about it. And so then you can decide, do I just get rid of that and put something else in? It, it's that. 
um, it's also akin to somebody saying to you, you know, if you're an artist, have you ever tried cerulean instead of just this, you know, sky blue, you know, or why don't you um, use this brush instead of just a pencil? Suddenly you have tools because somebody has given something that's there has always been there. You just didn't recognize this was something you can pick up and use. So that is the help of an editor too, to bring up these questions that are like giving you a, a, a tool for refining stories. Because ultimately what you want to do as a writer is to become your own best editor. Mm. Somebody who can look at your pages oh, and read them. You'd have to sit back and not look at them for at least a day and go back and read it with that editor reader point of view mm. and, and, and be brutally honest and say, well, I worked, I worked days on that sentence, but it has to go because it just sticks out as a little too pretty. Um, that sort of thing, you know, where you hear it enough, the questions come up enough, often enough, that you can recognize where, where these omissions are, um, these flaws that are florid language or overwrought scenes or flat scenes. Uh, and, and that's what I think a, a really good editor can do for a writer. You know, if you're lucky enough to have that kind of an editor. I think if Molly was here with us right now, she probably would have asked you about your earrings. She would have said, you know, ask Amy about the, <laughs> the golden, golden pearl earrings and where they come from. Yeah. Because that would be a story. <laughs> yes, the story would start with Siddharth saying <laughs> he had a dream that my <laughs> sister came and, and it was and she gave me these earrings. You didn't know about it. Um, Siddharth, as we should let everybody know, we do a lot of um, we do a lot of discussion by mostly by WeChat <laughs> or WhatsApp, what, WhatsApp, and a lot having to do with death and loss and fear and um, loyalty or disloyalty, betrayal, um, love, the qualities of love, and how to can you ever get rid of this or can you, you know, all of that. So this was, I was going through a really hard time with this election. And, uh, and I also had mentioned to somebody the other day when I lost it completely, I had to perform with the remainders of band in Tucson and my sister had died that day and I still had to perform and I was crazy. And I said, it feels like the time that I lost my sister. Mm -hmm. This election has you know, was made me want to scream. Mm. And, and, and then you told me about <laughs> this dream. And I said, Oh, yes, the earrings she gave me, and I hadn't worn them in a while. So I went and found them. And they look, there they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a, a little beautiful. talisman. So you know, of, since of Molly piece. is a writing teacher. Sorry. Oh, I didn't, I didn't say anything. Um, I said, since Molly is a writing teacher and, and somebody who continue to, to have a working question with, are there some lessons that you've learned from her that you could share with us, certain things that are very uh, obvious we may have missed, but where her expertise could help uh, refine and focus light on? Well, one, you know, it's, it's another, one of the brutal ones that saves you a lot of time, and that is don't, you know, start your novel, but don't obsess over the first chapter um, until you finish it because inevitably you're going to change a lot of that first chapter and um, by the time you get to the end of the novel you will see much more clearly what this book is about you may have had a sense but a, a novel has a strange way of deviating and going on its own course and coming up with a to a better place than you could have imagined hopefully um, so sometimes they would be having trouble with the first chapter and trying to, you know, settle. Now, how can I put this character in here and develop this? But I really, and I fussed with the language and she was right. By the end of the book, that chapter would be so 
completely revised that it was unrecognizable or it was thrown out or the first three pages were thrown out and and the chapter began on a different page or with the second chapter for example so those were the time saving things i don't know whether i actually learned that lesson enough i still fuss with the first page you know how it is you know you you're it's the entree and you're starting to imagine it's all going to unfold and you need to have exactly the right beginning mm -hmm. but but it's true i i tell myself don't go crazy over this just set yourself up setting the time the character the situation and move forward um you know molly would molly was the queen of cuts so look at things to cut and if things are getting complicated, look at whether or not there's, you know, I, I have a tendency to digress, as you can see in conversation, but also in writing. And um, wonderfully so. But <laughs> she would look at my, my pieces and she would say, I cut. So I'd look through things and with an eye toward economy. You know, how can I make this come through at a faster pace, mm. um, but not lose depth. You know, sometimes what I mean by faster pace, sometimes you, I would end up overwriting something. And that doesn't make the piece deeper. Mm -hmm. It actually occludes what might be something that is mm -hmm. the deeper meaning of something. You put too many words over it, too many abstract concepts, it just buries it. So I would have to look through that and say, where are the abstract parts of this? Where, what can I get rid of? What can I show and not tell? Um, it's a classic line that editors will use, show, don't tell. And it's a, it was a good one for me when I was a beginning writer because there is a tendency to explain what your story is about, both in the beginning and at the end. Um, Another thing that I learned uh, from Molly is that oftentimes your ending happens about two paragraphs before your actual end, <laughs> meaning cut out the last two paragraphs because what you've probably done is dissipated the power of the end of the story. And you've got to look at where the story actually ends. And, and in that case, learn to recognize what an ending of a story is. Um, the ending does not have to be the ending as what you see in a television program. It's often a sense of something then opening up into a new beginning of another story, in essence, completely satisfying the way that it ends. And yet knowing that this is not the end, it is the end of this particular story, not the end of all the possibilities of these characters and and my voice interacting and creating another story like that. So that was that was a big one too, is to go back and look at what the ending might really have been. A third of your editors is the legendary Daniel Halpern, who is the co-founder of the Echo Press at HarperCollins. What made you want to work with him? Well, he was so, um, he was, he pursued me and, and sent me such glowing words at a time when I was very down in my life and about my writing, um, just feeling completely frustrated. I had not had an editor except for Molly on the side, but not an in-house editor for 10 years, um, not since Faith had died. And I decided I needed to have an ally in the house. Not that my publishers were mean or anything, but I just wanted that person to be my support in the house, meaning in the publishing house. Mm -hmm. And Dan was said he had always wanted to have me as his author, and he'd send me poetry. He'd send me Borges, you know, poetry or books on, you know, favorite writers of his. Um, he is a poet. He's a published poet um, who hung out when he was young with uh, Paul Bowles in, in Tangier. Sky. <laughs> he is a guy who bought the, the 
paperback rights to Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential and wow. then became his publisher, um, publisher of Richard Ford, who is a writer whose works I had read since I first started writing fiction. Mm. Um, mm. Joyce Carol Oates, um, uh, who is a friend of yours. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, all these people became, you know, they were literary gods to me, or, and I'd be speechless when I went, met them the first time, but now they're friends. And, um, you know, it's, it, that's one of the wonderful things about what's happened in my life. Um, Joyce, Russell Banks, um, another great writer. Um, Bob Haas, the poet. Mm -hmm. You know, a number of really great writers and and he came to me and said he has had always wanted to publish me mm. and um told me what he loved all of this kind of stuff you know if you're t talking about if you're at smatch.com or whatever the the sites are tinder Tinder, tinder whatever it is i i don't keep up with what they are but tinder um and you know, and they say all the right things, you know, editor, compassionate, kind, you know, encouraging, loves everything, you know, has only your best interests at heart, you know, and then you just say, whoa, why not? As opposed to you have editors who don't really work with you, they're going to help push your book through the house. You know, a lot of editors do not have the time to work with a writer. Um, they expect your work to be pretty polished by time it arrives. Um, unless you have published a book already that's fairly successful, and then, you know, they'll give you that helping hand. But all of the editors I've had have been phenomenal in, in the way that they have offered much more intense uh, help, you know, feedback and, and all of that. Um, so D Dan, every now and then I, I'd send him something and he would exclaim over what was wonderful about it. And I just think, you know, I, I always thought that you had really good taste and now I'm beginning to doubt whether you do, I mean, half jokingly, but seriously. And I thought, well, maybe our friendship is interfering with his ability to see what I've written here because I think a lot of it is pretty awful. Uh, but he would find what was the parts that were good and, and you know, what could be fixed. And I, I'll read you something. This, is, this was something, when I turned in The Valley of Amazement, you know, that book was such a mess. I was so lost with this book. I started it over and over and over again. But here is some of what he wrote. Um, as I've been saying, I love this book. I feel I've lived it for months so that the characters are my people, the landscapes that, that PVE inhabited. And in many ways, it's, profound, it's a profound novel with so many intertwining themes, family, mother, daughter, relationship, diverse philosophies of life, intermix of cultures, subtexts around the rivals and departures. Just a beautiful book, and I hope the suggestions here help pull everything together to make it the book it deserves to be. Of course, I don't imagine you'll agree with everything here, but I wanted to ask all the questions and then give you the option of engaging or rejecting. As I said, there are no rules, and it's your book. So that's really important for a, an editor to give you complete respect mm -hmm. and autonomy they're there to be helpful, but never demanding. They are not the dictator of your book. Mm -hmm. um, so here is, is something that um, he said. After a number of chapters, there's a feeling of something repetitious in the narrative. A series of rises and falls in Violet's fortunes. And while any one incident makes for perfectly entertaining reading, the overall effect is to make the novel seem slightly repetitious and predictable. Violet's ups and downs become a somewhat static sine wave. The highs are equally high, the lows equally low. Mm -hmm. So that is 
amazingly helpful feedback to get from an editor and to look at that and say, yes, you know, that's exactly what I've done. Um, because if you have that quality, it is predictable. You know, you're going to go high to low, high to low, high to low. And, um, you know, and so I, I got to see that as a, as a trait, probably it's a, it's a trait of my work that I need to be aware of and uh, work at. But here is, <laughs> so you can see how much I love this. Well, this how lucky edit. we are to get a Look at this. The relationship with him. These, oh, wow. These are the notes that he gave me. And he detailed all of the characters and who they were. He detailed all of the timelines and what happens and where, and his reactions with what happens in each chapter, and all of that. And it was it was amazing. It was, it's such a gift to see what he had done that just opened my eyes and helped me understand what I had written. He mapped it out for you. My last question is also about uh, Daniel to you because um, I think in some senses he follows in the song lines of intellectual intimacy that had been set down by Faith because your late night emails to him then resulted in your last book, your memoir of writing, Where the Past Begins. Could you tell us yeah. a little about how that book came into being and then I'll lead into the questions that we have from your readers in India. Dan and I have a, an extensive email relationship and he would ask a question, how are you? And, uh, and then I would write for 10 pages, an email for 10 pages on how I was. And, but that is you know, very that true I, of you. Yes, I know. I have had this, this excessive, I, I'm garrulous and it's, it's a, a fault that some people love it. <laughs> And so I would write these long things, and then I'd say, how are you? And he'd say something like, uh, I'll explain later. <laughs> his, his remarks were always, um, I'll explain later, or <laughs> it, was, it was never really an answer. And, uh, and that was our joke. But after a while, um, he said, you know, we should do a book of our emails. And I said, oh, I think that sounds like a vanity press kind of project, you know, and he says, no, you know, you have, we're talking about the writing, it's writer, you know, writer to editor, editor, you know, feedback, but your feedback, what's happening in your life. And, and so we thought about it for a while and we started doing that. And then I decided for one thing, Dan's answers were always like, we'll talk about that later or, <laughs> hmm, you know, H M M. Hmm. Um, and I decided maybe I would do a chapter of book, but what I really wanted to do at that point was to write a book that had to do with writing and what I think of things like what we mean by creativity or imagination, um, what we mean by memory, uh, emotional memory, and how all of these things go into the writing of a book. Um, and it would include some of the emails because those emails did get to the nature of those elements in a book and in this particular book, The Valley of Amazement. So that ended up at, that, the bad thing about that book is that I gave myself a deadline. He, he wanted to help me get it done and, and impose the psychological whip. So he said, how about deadlines? which always scare me. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I, I can't, you know, I, I need the deadline. And he said, okay, so maybe a chapter every three weeks. And I said, no, once a week. He said, once a week, oh. you know, music to any editor's ears. And I said, once a week. And I kept to that. But the problem is that in the uncensored pell-mell of emotions coming up, from my memories, it was psychologically traumatizing, emotionally traumatizing. And I uncovered so many, so many things that were very upsetting to me. And, and then they were out there and he was reading them and then it was published. 
So I wasn't quite prepared to have it be out in the open. I am settled on that after a while. Now I can, I'm fine with it. But at the time when it was first published, I, I just, yeah, what have I done? Mm. But now I think it's a great technique if you want to get your book done. Give yourself a one week deadline and you just have to keep going. It doesn't matter. You can't say I, I ran out of time. You just have to turn in what you did for that week. And it's got to be a chapter, the arc of a, of a chapter. Wow. It can't be a fragment. It has to be. And, and you force yourself to do that. And it's amazing what comes out. So Granton, yeah. uh, Anil Dharkar, the, the festival director, had, uh, uh, had you know, put your talk out there and so many people sent in dozens and dozens of questions. Uh, we've picked a few. This is from Hina K. When you're writing a book as intricate as the bone setter's daughter, how do you keep track of the various plot lines and characters' real, fictional, and imagined experiences? Oh, it's easy. You have your editor do it for you. And, and he puts together the timeline and all the characters. Um, now, that's, that's a very good question. I think it's the reason why we novelists sometimes find ourselves in knots. We've, we've followed threads here and there. We've done this other thread. We've done a revision without changing this other thread. And they, it just turns into a big mess. Um, I don't have to separate things out based on what's real or you know, imaginative, um, uh, because in the case of that book, The Valley of Amazement, everything was not based, it was not based on my life. It, that was the one you were talking about, really, The Valley of Amazement? We were speaking, well, I mean, my question to you was really about where the past begins in, uh, well, the bone oh. daughter, and, and how do you keep the tr uh, track of the various- Oh, the bone bonesetter's daughter. Yeah, that was, um, that was the question that from one the did have a, That did have a real component to it based on my mother's, um, she, she had Alzheimer's disease. And so I have a mother in there. Um, I wrote that book after, after she died. Um, and it was all about, it was really about the nature of memory. Um, things that we forget and things that, can never be forgotten um, and the impact of that. I didn't really understand what I was writing until after she and Faith died. They died two weeks apart. Mm -hmm. And so I began that book over again. So the real part was the emotions around a mother who's losing her memory. And then the rest of it was completely fictional. Uh, the characters, Precious Auntie and Ruth and uh, Peking Man, uh, what was going on there. Um, that story was um, governed a lot by, say, historical facts. So if you're going to talk about what's real, there's that element as well. When you're looking at timelines, and um, if you make a reference to Peking Man, who, by the way, that little skull cap piece was actually a woman, mm -hmm. but Peking Man, you need to keep to who was there and where it was and, and all of that. So I, I did have to keep track of those things. But you know, imagination is, is wonderfully fluid and, um, and dangerous. And so you just um, require, it requires again, an editor who should be yourself to read the, the pages in progress uh, with a fresh eye uh, after you set it down for a day and read it again out loud for clarity and see where things start to deviate and uh, get confusing or muddled or repetitious. Pamela asks, how different would your books be if an editor wasn't involved in the process? Um, well, with the first one, it never would have been published. Um, <laughs> With the second one, if I had no editor, it probably would have get, gotten published and gotten completely bombed by bad reviews. Um, third one, I would have lost my confidence and then I never would have written a thing, anything again. Um, 
I just think of them as being so important. It's, it's funny, as a writer, I want the solitude. I want to write by myself. I don't want somebody over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I can't have anybody saying we need a love scene here. I mean, that to me would drive me nuts if somebody suggested what I should write. But there comes a point where you know it's going to be public. And you want to know what somebody thinks. And, and, and they can save you. They can open your eyes. They can make you a better writer. So um, the, the good or bad thing about being a published writer and having a very successful first book is that basically people will publish anything. It could be really, really bad, and they'll still publish it. Um, but that's why you need an editor who cares enormously that you are able to present the work as they know you are capable of doing uh, because they love what you write. They love you as a person and they just want what is best. So, so but, that that's basically it. I don't think I would have been published without an editor. Now that seems to preclude a lot of people from ever getting published because how many people have an editor before they get published? I had an editor through Molly Giles in the beginning because I attended a writer's workshop once a week and she was the leader and we paid her, mm -hmm. you know, a certain amount of money. All of us, the, there were about eight of us in the group and we read our stuff aloud and she critiqued. And um, so that was an editor. You go to certain conferences, you, you can get that kind of feedback as a new writer. And I think it's enormously helpful enormously helpful also to understand you should not listen to everybody's comments and tear apart your writing they are not writing your book some people like to give you advice as the book they would like to write um and um uh, but i think it it keeps you on a path mm -hmm. and it keeps you open to hearing what is going on in your story so that you can refine your writer editor mind Sumita so asks, should you leave an editor who does not seem to see your vision? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, why would you be with somebody who's against your best interests? Um, now, a writer, an editor doesn't, not every editor is going to get what you're writing. Um, I have rejection letters from different people who one says there's too much Chinese stuff going on and another says there's not enough Chinese stuff going on. I mean, you can have it, you know, the language is to this, the language is not enough that, and it's opposite. You aren't going to necessarily find complete rapport in, with one editor. You're very lucky if you find it, you know, the first time, but in, sometimes you don't have a choice because somebody likes it and and you don't have a lot of other people you can choose from, but you should, you know, find out why do they like the book? What, what do they see? What kind of writer they think you are, especially if you're a new writer, how can they possibly help you in future books? You know, they should, basically the criteria is they should love your writing. They should love your book. If it's the first book you given them and they've taken it on, they should love it to pieces. If they don't, if they're sort of, well, let's see what happens by the end of page 300. You know, it's a lot of investment of emotion and energy and time uh, with a relationship that may not succeed. Here's an interesting question from Anita that it's been 30 years since the release of the Joy Luck Club. And the relationship between America and China has changed dramatically in Turin. So if you were to write a sequel to the Joy Luck Club, what would it be about? Uh, interesting question, because there is a movie deal on the horizon. So we will get to see what that is. Um, I will be doing that with the original uh, co-screenwriter. And we've talked about some ideas. Some of them uh, are shocking to me. But... I think that what are those fucking ideas? I know I can't tell you what it is, but I just think that I am I have been out of touch with the real world. I don't have children, 
And, you know, we've gone through, we've blown past millennials. <laughs> and now we're into Z, Z gen. And I don't have those either in my life. Actually, I, uh, family next door, mm -hmm. they're my little mm -hmm. grandkids. And um, I see them all the time. But, you know, I, I need to understand this, this other world of generations. So, um, Tinder. <laughs> huh? Tinder? Also, the generation that uses <laughs> Tinder. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's also looking at the soul of the original book and the characters. We would have all the original actors that were playing the mothers and daughters, if we can possibly have them, if they're still, you know, acting. Um, and, and then having their... You know, the daughters now are the mothers who have their daughters, and there's probably little other grandkids involved, but um, contemporary situations, but similar themes having to do with who you are, especially with with a generation that is biracial. Um, and uh, a generation, you know, all of our stories are influenced somewhat by politics, whether we're writing politically or not. We are, you know, got, our stories are set in a particular time and place and are governed externally by what has happened, what is happening there. So it may be that the stories take place in a Trump era, who knows, or we want, might want to make it more timeless. Um, uh, but it would be those kinds of things, or job market, or mm -hmm. things to do with uh, sexuality, mm -hmm. or, gender, you know. Gender. Yeah, we what we mean by families now. Um, so many things have happened over the last. Well, I wrote that book in 1989, or it published in 1989, and the world has changed significantly. Um, so many ways. Global warming and that's not going to be going away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the notion of a future um, very much is on people's mind in general. The notion of a future when you have generations in a family uh, and what matters. I'm not saying that's what the book is about or the, the sequel. I'm just saying there is going to be a sequel. Um, and I, I will, you know, we've been talking about different storylines, but some I, of the things I like think. discovering are shocking. I have been such a, you know, uh, closeted away in my little place here in Sausalito and <laughs> not really aware of, all I, think the you're a, I think you're pulling a Daniel Halpern on us by saying, hmm, I'll tell you about it later. Mm, I'll tell you about it later. No, I, I, I honestly, you know, the nice thing is that Ron Bass, the screenwriter who won an Academy Award, has written, he's such an experienced uh, screenwriter uh, and producer. And he, um, he has lots of ideas, but he has a, a team of assistant writers and they're all millennial women and wow. so we can go to them and and but he's definitely the writer and i'll be contributing and he you know we'll write certain scenes together but uh it's funny i i learned to write a screenplay through writing with ron and i would send him my pages he says why did he talk through the whole thing, what this book was about, the soul of the book, what the, the film would be about in terms of the soul of the movie, but things had to change. He outlined the whole thing, three acts, all the scenes, how many minutes per scene. And then he said, take a crack at it, write the first scene. And I had no idea. I'd send this stuff to him, come back, It'd be all marked up. And, and it was exciting. It was the same thing that I felt about you know, getting feedback on my stories. It was like, I have all this stuff I can, I'm going to learn. It was, you know, and so we'll do that process. We'll revisit that process again. Uh, granted, your new novel is uh, under progress. It's called The Memory of Desire. Would you consider giving your readers a clue about it? <laughs> That's something I find really hard to talk about especially since I'm so confused about what this book really is. Um, I think it'll be a clear book to me. What happened was um, the, um, the election 
in 2016, which derailed uh, the book I had in mind. Uh, the book originally was going to be uh, more on the side of satirical mm -hmm. and uh, was looking at in, in part two families, but also this disparity of their situations. Uh, one family from China, you know, and then the, the old days, the Chinese, the family in China used to be so poor and, you know, dream of coming to America where cars fly and et cetera, et cetera. But now, of course, the Chinese family is fabulously wealthy <laughs> and the American family is not. And, and there is some dispute in the past. And wow. it's got to be. Okay. So this was the original idea I had for the novel, but it was going to be kind of a, a satirical, lighthearted way that we look at things. And then the election happened. And I just felt that suddenly the novel was irre irrelevant. It was trivial um, because of, of this great danger that was going on. You know, who cares about this family? Uh, and the themes of the, the novel were not really pertinent to the, the urgency of what was going on at the time. So I had to stop that novel and I started another one that had a more serious theme. I, I hate that word, you know, but there's nothing you can do about it. What would you call it, Siddharth? What do you call these things that are, are they themes? Are they obsessions? Are they... I would say conflicts that I'm trying to resolve. <clears throat> Conflicts, yeah. yeah, it's this these dilemmas. I'm know. trying to answer. <clears throat> yeah, Tony because Martin the themes, says that. there's sort of a big, uh, there's is like a country, it's a territory, but you you need to have a situation within mm -hmm. that that country or the theme, you yeah. know. So I hate the word theme. It's like a term paper word, you know. But anyway, the theme of of if you were looking at the theme of racism or the theme of displacement or the theme of uh, loss of, of personal identity. You know, all of those are themes. How do you put that together into a story that is felt, as Faith would say? Mm. Felt meaning something is really at stake personally for me, but also is a story that has uh, enough relevance that it is its own propulsion to get me through the story you know without that it, it's it's just it can just sit there forever you know making fun of this family and that family and <laughs> not go anywhere so I I think now with our our recent election maybe I can go back to the other one I've already started this new one that I I, I actually like very much um, the other one would probably be you just have to do easier. two novels Yes, well, that's that's what my editor says. You know, two novels, yeah, for the price of one. Um, the the first one I dreamt that novel mm. from start to finish, and it was it structure everything about it was very clear. But then I had to start over again. So it's hard for me to talk about. I've already said too much. If anybody you know, we'll edit it out. Publishes what I just said. I'll have to sue you. <laughs> because <laughs> I've made it all up. That's not what my next book is about. It's just fiction. Amy Tan is just, just pulling fiction, a fast one. But... <laughs> okay, so now I know we're running over time. So my quick uh, thing to you is, are you coming back to India anytime soon? Yes, as soon as we have a vaccine. And I am coming. I'm going to go to Goa and be in your lovely retreat there and we're going to be in Mumbai also to... you know what I just I loved was I a little dinner in Udaipur at the Dai restaurant and all these readers of yours who just came up these young women who had read your books and who came up and said you know like can we just have a quick word with her and I was so moved by the intimacy, by the fact that we were sitting and having this anonymous dinner and these young women came up and said you know Amy Tan really touched my life reading her books here in Udaipur. Uh, so you have to come back for them. You have to come back well, with young women who read your work here, who really, really 
find so much of emotional resonance with you. Amy Tan, thank you. You are a hero oh, of our you. collective imagination. Thank you so thank much. You. My one million pronouns to you for being a part of it. <laughs> and thank you to all the readers out there. Thank you. Thank you to thank the readers. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to thank the authors for that wonderful session. We hope you enjoyed it too. We would like to thank our sponsors, title sponsor Tata, co-sponsors Tata Steel and Tata Projects, session sponsor Kotak. With many exciting sessions lined up, please do head over to our website, tatalitlive.in, to find out about them. Coming up next, Martin Kemp explores the genius of Da Vinci at 3.30. And at 4 p.m., you can also tune into the many worlds of Robert Harris. See you there.